Welcome everyone to our technical Tinker with Pay2 virtual fireside chat. I'm Chris Ponton Dwyer, Senior Sales Executive at Zepto. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm hosting today's webinar from my home in the Sutherland Shire in Sydney, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the Darawal people, who are the traditional custodians of the lands within the Sutherland Shire, uh, and pay my respects to elders and their families past, present and emerging. Uh, and I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to the various lands everyone is joining us from today. This is now our fifth instalment of our Zepto Connect webinar series, and we've had some fascinating conversations that have ranged from the future of the Australian tech scene, to the consumer data right, and of course, pay two. You can check out all of our webinars and other great content on our newly formed YouTube page, which will be shared in the chat over the course of today's conversation. Now, speaking of chat, there's a bit of housekeeping. Uh, these webinars really rely on the success. The success relies on the audience interaction. And so you're gonna see two functions on the right-hand side, a chat, which is a messaging icon, where you can post general comments in the chat and have a conversation amongst the audience members. There's also beneath that a Q&A box. Now, if you wanna ask questions of the panel, you can post your questions in that Q&A box. I'll be monitoring that during the course of today's conversation. I'll try to get through as many as I can. Now you can also upvote specific questions that someone else has posted, which you, if you wanna get answered by the panel, it'll push it up to the top of the list for me to read. So when you're ready, start populating with your questions. Now, before we get into the conversation, we always just like to give a bit of a status update on uh, where availability in the market is at with Pay2. So since our last webinar, which was a month ago, uh, it hasn't been a lot of movement, but there were some big announcements at the last one. So we shared that all four major banks are now live with Pay2 in the retail market. And that's 91% of consumer accounts now have Pay2 available as a payment method. So really have reached that tipping point uh, of ubiquity. Now, on a business account perspective, availability remains at around 15%, uh, but currently tracking upwards over the next 12 months. And another use case and update I wanted to, to touch on, which we have announced since our last webinar, was an exciting partnership with AusEdi. Now, if you don't know who AusEdi is, they play a critical role in the superannuation industry delivering a digital data exchange service that connects a company's payroll to superannuation funds nationally. That's done via SuperStream, which is the government's legislated messaging service to provide super contribution information between businesses and super funds. AusEdi has chosen to partner with Zepto to combine their existing data exchange service with the ability to allow Australian businesses to instantly and securely pay contributions to super funds nationally via the new payments platform, and yes, leveraging Pay2. Now this becomes even more critical in light of the government's payday super legislation requiring businesses to pay super the same day as they pay salary. And this is a first of a kind partnership and a great example of how real-time payments can have a massive benefit to our economy and community. And we look forward to sharing more Pay2 use cases with you as they come to life. Now for today's topic, a technical tinker with Pay2. So why this topic, why today? Well, during recent Zepto Connect webinars, we received a number of technical questions about Pay2. And we took a poll uh, of attendees at the last session, asking them to vote on the topic they wanted to hear about most. And technical deep dive was by far and away the most popular topic. So you asked, we are here today to deliver a technical session on Pay2 as requested. Now, let me introduce you to the panel today. And I'm really excited to introduce you to these guys. Now, I'm a big believer in the saying, if you're the smartest person in the room, then you are in the wrong room. I can say without a doubt today, I am in the right virtual room. We have set those foremost Pay2 experts here to answer your questions, take us deep into the inner workings of Pay2, and more importantly, provide some practical advice and insight that will help all of you who are trying to understand what Pay2 will mean for your own organizations. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the team. Justin Steer. Now, I don't use the word guru very often, but Justin Steer is a payments guru. He has deep experience as a solutions engineer on both cards and wallets side of payments, a senior solutions engineer at Braintree and PayPal. He then moved to the account to account side at Go Cardless before joining Zepto, where he leads our solutions and customer success team. If you work with us, you have interact with Justin or someone in his team at some point. Welcome, Justin. Next, Jamie Wistaff. 
Now, you may all be asking, Septo, why do we need to have a webinar on the technical side of Pay2 when your online Pay2 Help Center answers all our questions in a clear and concise manner? Well, this is your chance to hear from the person who built our Pay2 Help Center, Jamie. She is our Senior Solutions Engineer and was recently awarded Zepto's Rising Star Award for her work across Pay2. She has played a key role in buddy testing with the banks of part of their go-live and is working with a range of our clients to support their Pay2 implementation. Welcome, Jamie. Now, last but certainly not least, Tom Campbell, Zepto's Pay2 Product Manager. From day one, Tom has been central to our Pay2 product strategy. He represents Zepto on the AP Plus Pay2 User Forum driving collaboration as an industry leader to further the Pay2 cause. Tom spends his days deep in thought on how we can optimize Pay2 to solve customer problems. And when I asked Tom what topics he wanted me to ask him during this conversation, he said, Chris, there's two things I can talk about, Pay2 and Porsche motor cars. Today, we'll focus on the former. Welcome, Tom. So I might get you to all come off mute. And I thought I'd throw out a warm-up question just to get uh, the juices flowing today. Um, I want you all to give me three words that come to mind when you describe pay to. Now, because our title of today's webinar does such a good job of alliteration, technical tinker of pay to, you will get bonus points if you can alliterate your response. I'm going to hand to Justin three words that describe pay to. <laughs> Fast, new, revolutionary. Awesome. Love it. I'm going to pass to Jamie next. Oh, no, you stole two of my words. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say fast, new, and easy. Fast, new, and easy. I'll accept that answer. Tom Campbell. Yeah, um, that's a lot of words. Uh, burn through, isn't it? Um, I think I was also going to say fast, uh, but I think... Um, yeah, visible, quick, and modern um, are uh, the three I'd go with. Awesome. I think they are all very relevant words in describing pay two. Not a lot of alliteration there. I was looking for digitizing direct debit as a key one in the alliteration stage, but let's uh, move on with the conversation. So what I might do is get us to bring up the slide pack. Uh, and when we're talking about technology, it's really important to start with the customer experience in mind. Uh, and you know, talk about what are the use cases that we're trying to serve with this new, new piece of capability. Um, so while that slide pack is coming up, what I wanted to start, how I want to do this, I'll run through on a high level what the use case is, all right? And then Jamie, what I'll get you to do is talk through what's happening under the hood. So we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so I wanted to start out pretty simple and straightforward with just a simple e-commerce one-off purchase. Now, if we start on the left, that's a, a screenshot of a standard e-com uh, checkout where I'm selecting my payment method. In this instance, we're selecting pay two. The customer would enter their pay ID or their BSBN account number and click pay. What happens then is they receive a push notification in their mobile banking app, which has the agreement for them to authorize that payment. At the same time, in real time, we are getting back in that online checkout a confirmation of the payment and the order is successful. And then in that last screenshot on the right in number four, that is the reporting updating in real time that funds have been received in the account. Okay, pretty straightforward. Jamie, why don't you just take us through what's actually happening there with Pay2? Yeah, definitely. First off, great job on the introductions. I feel like you've very much raised the bars <laughs> with the, uh, the intros. Um, but yes, if we could go to the next slide, what I'll do is I'll talk through the actual pay to flow. So you might not be able to read any of this and that's okay because I will zoom in. Um, but what you're seeing here is a high level end to end um, pay to flow for this example here. It might seem like a lot is going on, but what I like to do and remind everybody is that this is actually two separate actions that we're looking at. So the first half of this flow is actually the agreement piece. And then the second half is the payment piece. So what we'll do is I'll just kind of dive into um, the agreement piece first, and then we'll speak to the payment. 
So this is what the actual agreement flow looks like on the back end. So as Chris mentioned, when you're looking at the um, that demo checkout process that we just looked at, the user is inputting their, um, they select pay to, they might put in their pay ID. And the second they click submit, what's actually happening on the back end is that e-commerce shop is interacting with our API and sending through the actual agreement terms. And if you just flip back to the slide, the agreement slide, we flip back by accident here. Perfect, thank you. So what you're seeing here is that initial step is that interaction with Zeto's API. We'll do some validation on the data that's being provided. So we just need to make sure that the terms of the agreement is, fits the templates that are expected. And then from that point, it's actually created and sent through to the end customer. So within this might take a, like a handful of seconds, that's where the user will actually see that agreement show up in their banking application as Chris mentioned in the previous. Then from that point, let's just assume this is a beautiful happy flow, the customer will authorize that agreement right away. And that is really the first piece of pay to is that agreement piece. So once you've, that has happened, we can go to the payment flow, thank you. We're actually sending a notification right back to that merchant application, so that e-commerce shop, notifying them that, yep, Chris has actually accepted that agreement, so you're good to go. At that very moment, the um, website will actually then trigger the payment request. So they know that the agreement is set, so they're now ready to actually request to pull those funds for that floral t-shirt that Chris wanted. So at that point, again, um, we will verify that that information matches the terms of the agreement. So this is a quick example of that. If the t-shirt was, or Chris accepted that the t-shirt was gonna be worth $55 and that's what he authorized in his banking app. If for some reason something happens and the website now wants to pull $65, we're actually gonna stop that right there because that is not what Chris agreed to. Chris only wanted to spend $55 on that t-shirt. So assuming that passes, again, this is all happens in real time. So I might be taking a little bit of time to talk here, but. Um, the funds are actually debited from Chris's account, assuming he has that $55 in his account and are immediately credited to the merchant's nominated account. And then that's the end. So those two pieces, the agreement and the payment, all make up that entire flow that we saw in that first screen and line up with a single purchase. So really from that moment that user puts in their information and they click checkout, everything starts to happen. And then the second they also authorize that agreement, everything happens in real time. And those screens between the number two and number three happen in real time and within seconds. Amazing. Okay, that's really great. So there's, a, there's an agreement portion happening and then the payment portion and all of that is happening in real time. Okay, yep. so look, that's a, that's a pretty simple, straightforward use case. Um, maybe let's slip to the next slide let's talk about what a recurring wow. payment is right because i think we've got a lot of um organizations attending today where you know customer um loyalty is key return visits mm -hmm. or frequency of payment is built into their proposition um so in this instance you know the example is a subscription service all right if i start on the, the left side again we've got someone signing up to a subscription electing to pay with pay two just as before um, they click submit payment uh, that notification comes through uh, in three we can see the details of the mandate request that the, the agreement request that they are authorizing and mm -hmm. then in step four we've got the recurring payment that is being taken out each month and that final page is around the automatic reconciliation and um, uh, settlement of funds in real time so can you talk us through what the difference is here um, between what we saw in that first use case and what happens in a recurring flow. Yeah, definitely. One thing I just wanna point out as well is you might hear both um, the term agreement and mandate be used. Those can be used interchangeably. They are the same thing in this, in the case of pay to. Um, but definitely, so really what, um, how everything works, again, going back to the idea that you have two pieces, right? You have the agreement and then you have the payment. So in an example of a recurring payment, it really comes down to what you put into that actual agreement itself. So for the first example, we were looking at something as an example that was a fixed price. It would only be debited once. And you might even add a certain expiry date to that, whether it's you know the following business day as an example. So really that 
agreement in the first scenario was very strict. It was one time, that's it. Once the payment is done, it can't be used again. For something like a recurring payment, you can actually add um, certain terms or select certain types um, as an example, usage base. So my energy bill on a monthly basis might vary depending on how much I'm using um, my energy in the house or my apartment. Um, you can use balloon rates. So there's a few options there. You can also use variable. And what ends up happening is you're still going through the same process where the user will be prompted with that agreement, but the terms will be slightly different. So as an end customer, when I get that initial agreement, I know that, again, let's just use energy, that in the terms of the agreement, I'm going to get bills or you know debited from my account on a monthly basis from X company, and there might be a maximum value as an example. So it might just know that at a maximum value within this term, I won't get debited more than $500 a month for my energy bill. Once that's approved, because of the terms that you've set on that, you can actually then initiate more than one payment against that one agreement. So you're not having to actually ask the user to accept an agreement on a monthly basis because it's already set, the expectation is there, the consent is there as well. So on a monthly basis, what your application can initiate a payment, it references that agreement that was created. Zepto will just validate to make sure that yes, this payment is within the terms of the agreement and pull those funds. And you can simply just, again, initiate those payments on a monthly basis. To answer your question. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. No, I think that does a great job. Uh, I think more questions are popping to mind as 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 you as you talk through that, and just reminded the audience. I can see a question coming through, but let's let's um, start. Feel free to populate those. So maybe we'll drop the slides and bring the other guys back um, just to unpack some of this in a bit more. So, Tom, I might throw to you on this one. Um, so obviously, we saw a couple of use cases. What's happening in the back end? Can you just tell us what's Zepto's role? Um, in, in processing pay two. Um, uh, and we've got a question from the audience that, you know, is that flow standard regardless of the MPP connected participant? Um, so maybe you can just talk about Zepto's role and, and, you know, what it means as a connected institution versus other participants as well. Yeah, sure thing. So ultimately, Zepto's role is really a sort of a financial infrastructure layer or is what we like to call FINFRA. And it's really the sort of the, the, the core the core crux of that is really just being a, um, a foundational piece of your business payments infrastructure that just works. Um, and so ultimately, as sort of Jamie had mentioned there, you've got the pay to sort of underlying agreement and the payment initiation message. And and what's really happening there sort of as like, there is sort of a, I think the answer to the question as to whether or not that flow is standard, there is ultimately sort of a, um, an underlying standard pathway with a number of um, different sort of possible um, different sort of possible pathways through, um, much like a like a large decision tree, um, and depending on what we get back at each stage is sort of how we sort of guide things through, um, you know, as sort of a payment initiation happens. So, I think maybe the way to conceptualise that is just to sort of describe a little bit more about um, Zepto's role in that process. Um, and so, ultimately, um, you know, yeah, as Jamie said, agreement sort of is your sort of your fundamental layer. Um, but in order to trigger, you know, your payment initiation on behalf of the customer or on behalf of the merchant, rather, um, it's really all about sort of the creation um, and posting of that request to our create payment endpoint. We then perform some initial validation checks um, to ensure that that request is both well formed um, and is in line with the terms um, of the agreement that's been created. Um, and we'll only process in the event that that, that that request is in line with those terms. Um, we then, as sort of as a connected institution, you know, we submit that pain.001 or payment initiation message directly onto the NPP's basic infrastructure um, in order to trigger, you know, the pool of funds from the target account through to the destination account. And that's something that's either defined um, during the sort of the mandate creation process or something that might be defined later on during the, um, the payment creation process. And so once we actually have processed or placed that request, assuming it's all well formed, onto the basic infrastructure, we then expect to receive, you know, a series of other messages referred to as payment status reports. And depending on the combination of reports that we get back, that's how we then start to um, filter that through. So, you know, your, your sort of your, your possible outcomes include failure um, under investigation or settle. We expect the vast majority to settle. Um, but in the event of a failure, 
you know, Zept is providing a really um, detailed set of error messaging, you know, to assist merchants with triaging um, and refining, you know, their own customer experience. Um, because ultimately that means that, you know, if your customer's standing at a, at a checkout, um, you know, there's a need to ensure that that customer's um, probably taken care of. Got it. Okay. Okay. That's fantastic. So if that's the role Zepto plays, what does a merchant need to do to, or a business need to do to facilitate a pay to transaction? Uh, Jamie, I'll, I'll throw it back to you for this one. Yeah, so we were talking about um, the different use cases. So it really does, is, you might hear me say this quite a few times today, by the way, it really does depend on the use case. But at the end of the day, it's better understanding of the business flow you're trying to create and making sure that you have the necessary information to create that pay to mandate to start with. So if it is a one-off versus a recurring, you might need to have different information. And then also once that's actually created, once you're starting to interact with the Zepto API, we will also then provide information back. Um, it's unique identifiers based on the agreement. What uh, might be a unique identifier for the payment as well. So it's also certain data that you a merchant might want to be uh, wants to be ready to actually ingest and store in whatever way they see fit within their business process. So de again, depending if they have their own account system or they want users to be able to log in and see their data, then they might want to store a little bit more as well. Um, but it's just all things to keep in mind as they um, as they're looking to onboard or to use Pay2 is how they're planning on using it and yeah, how creative they want to get with it. Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm hearing uh, data being mentioned as, as being important, right? And obviously fundamental mm -hmm. to what Zepto's role is, is part of that messaging to the MPP infrastructure. Um, Justin, let's hear from you. Can you please maybe talk to, you know, we talk a lot about the benefit of data within the MPP. Um, you know, can you talk about the role of data in the payment flow for, for Pay2? And, and, you know, how can uh, this benefit both the end customer and, and the merchant maybe? Yeah, definitely. So I think there's you know a couple of different aspects that, that certainly come into play when we talk about data with regards to Pay2 and or NTP in general. Um, some of them which Jamie and Tom just sort of alluded to. So I think you know on the customer side, Pay2 provides I guess a number of data points that you know a elicit consumer trust and confidence in you know not just the merchant that they're engaging with, but also the underlying payment mechanic. Um, you know the way I look at it is you know if you look at a traditional direct debit via Bex flow where you're providing a BSB and account number, you're agreeing to your DDR, DDRSA, maybe you're receiving a PDF copy of that agreement or service that you're entering into, which if you're anything like me, you'll ignore and it'll get lost in your email inbox. And then 30 days later, you see a charge in your bank statement where the description is limited to a character set that doesn't give you a, a great deal of information about that transaction at all. Um, so with Pay2, that, that customer is afforded the, the agreement information on hand within their banking environment, which details the payment terms that Jamie spoke about. So things like, you know, how frequently am I going to be debited? What amount am I going to be debited? Um, as well as a descriptive piece of information around the mandate that's been set up with regards to who the merchant is, what this agreement is for, you know, how it relates to the merchant that they've interacted with in the past. Um, subsequent to that, you know, and ch any changes to that agreement, um, you know, if suddenly the price of my gym membership has gone up by, $10 a month, there's an amendment which gets sent through via the merchant. In that case, I'd need to authorize it. So I explicitly know that, yes, okay, my, my payments are going up by, by 10 bucks a month. Um, so yeah, it's a really well thought out flow for that, that end customer. Um, on the merchant side, there's, I guess, also a, a number of benefits compared to perhaps other payment methods out there. So again, on the agreement front, Merchants or organizations are receiving that real-time messaging around any change in status of an agreement. Um, so you know, typically you have to wait for a payment message to go through um, to indicate that an agreement you know, has been canceled, the bank account's been closed, anything along those sort of lines. Um, with Pay2, we are giving you that information back in real time. So if I as a customer decide that, you know, I have terminated my gym membership, I've informed the gym, but for whatever reason, they haven't canceled my, my payment arrangement. I can jump into my, my banking application, cancel that agreement. The gym then, you know, is then informed that, okay, cool, Justin has canceled that agreement. Um, payments are never gonna be successful against this canceled mandate now. Um, 
For payments and sales, and, and Tom sort of touched on this just prior, I guess there's, you know, there is an extensive list of reason codes that can be returned in the event of any error or failure um, that really give you a granular look into why a payment failed, whether it's retriable or not, um, and allowing you to do, I guess, then determine the most appropriate course of action for your customer moving forward. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, overall the level of data around pay to is beneficial to you know both the payer customer and the merchant, um, and I think you know really enables the best experience for both parties. Amazing. That's um, yeah, obviously very powerful, and really that visibility on the transaction, I suppose, is is and, and granular visibility is is a key point of difference and value for pay too. Um, I might just flick to some of the questions. We've got lots of questions coming in. So thank you very much, everyone. So I'll, I'll start with a, a potentially an easy one. Um, is mobile banking app the only way for a customer to authorize a payment agreement? Uh, Tom, I might throw to you. You're on mute. Yeah, of course. Um, so look, short answer is no. Um, essentially what is happening at the moment is a rollout of pay to across multiple channels um, out in the ecosystem. So that includes mobile applications, desktop applications, so on and so forth for agreement management. I think that said, um, it is a rollout. So it means that at the moment, um, the you know most dominant channel is mobile. Um, but as time goes by, you can expect to see other channels starting to come online um, and, um, and a bit more information out in market about specifically what's available and when. Um, and so, you know, we can uh, we can always make some time to chat about specifically which uh, which channels are, are currently online. Um, but I think, yeah, that's sort of also coloured with um, the sort of the availability of retail accounts. You know, most of it, most of those channels are going to be sort of mobile in a retail context. Um, and you know, we'd expect to see uh, some of the more business banking portals um, in the des desktop context starting to come online um, as sort of business bank accounts. Um, are, uh, are made sort of all paid to enabled over the next 12 months. Um, but yeah, good question. Yeah, so it's really obviously pay to is a, a digital solution and it's primarily going to be um, available via digital channels. Is that fair to say? Yeah, 100%. Um, that's, that's largely what we'd expect to see, yeah. Okay, okay, awesome. Um, so I'll keep going. There's, let me just have a look. Um, so uh, we've talked a lot about some of the messaging back and forth between a, a merchant and um, regarding pay to status. Question um, is, do banks offer merchants webhooks for payment confirmation via pay to, or is that the issue solved by Zepto as middleware? Um, Justin, I might hear from you on this one. Yeah, so the webhook messages that you get or could get will be from Zepto. The banks specifically are not sending out webhook events to direct merchants themselves um so we you know i guess elicit that that event service on our side so when we hear back um the appropriate responses from the credit and the bank uh, we will then return that information back to your merchant application by form of webhook alternatively you can pull our api to get the most up-to-date um, message available okay great so that that comes from us um okay uh i'll keep going because there's lots of great questions here um what does real time actually mean? And how do the banks handle this real time payment? Um, Jamie, is that something you, you want to comment on? Yeah, I can always comment on this, and then somebody else can jump in. Um, what does real time mean? So, you know, we're still pulling all of the data when it comes to pay to pay to in real time, but there are SLAs in place as to what um, banks are expected to meet when it comes to the, this real-time payment method. What we've seen so far, I can share, um, is we are looking at um, a handful of seconds per action. So if we're looking at initiating an agreement, you know, that might take anywhere between, I want to say, three and eight seconds. Eight has been really the slower end when it comes to an agreement. Um, and then there's the period of time, of course, where it requires a user to accept, which we don't have, you know, control over. And then the payment, same thing, just a couple seconds. So we're seeing really that debit of funds and credit of funds within a handful of seconds. It's very, very quick. I don't know if Justin or Tom has any additional feedback on that. Yeah, I, I think what we'd add is that, you know, I think, you know, as the sort of 
pay to product in this market and we're able to do sort of more, sort of more and more performance testing um you know we're sort of reviewing and calculating our sort of p50 p95 p99 to get an understanding of you know sort of where that sort of where those payments sort of fall um but largely the data at this point um you know sort of early on in the piece um you know and as we sort of continue to optimize we expect it to hopefully um increase in speed but yeah we're sort of looking at uh, you know a handful of seconds um which early doors is great Okay, and, and just another question in a similar vein, uh, more on the clearing of funds. So how long it's taking now for the data bank to clear the funds on receiving a request to pay message, um, just to understand the scale of real time? I don't know if we have the, the data specifically, Justin, is that something we have available right now for the, just the clearing? Um, I, similar to Tom's point, it's something we are yeah. going uh, sort of collating i think you know when it comes to the actual flow it, it's all sort of handled in that one action right so if mm -hmm. we initiate that pain 001 message you know there's a, a, a payment and clearance message sent between the data bank and the creditor bank and then reference to jamie's point earlier around the slas that are in place they they apply to both debtor and creditor bank so we do mm -hmm. expect that clearance and settlement process to be handled within that 31 second sla Okay, fantastic. Um, I'll keep going with some of the questions because they, they, they are piling up, which is awesome. Um, so uh, who is the actor or end user of the reporting funds settled at the end of the flow? So Jamie, do you want to maybe cover that one off? So when we went through the use cases, this one was asked a bit earlier on. Um, there's that yep. reporting funds. Uh, who mm -hmm. is the actor or end user there? So who would be handling that would be the actual merchant application. So we have all of that data readily available. All of that can be pulled via our API, but um, it really comes down to the merchant and what information they do want to pull and how they want to do their own reporting. So they can create really their own custom workflow with what works with their current business process rather than trying to retrofit our process within theirs. So really it's full, full options out there. Okay, okay, awesome. Um, Look, I, I suppose a, a lot of people on the, on this uh, webinar are probably, you know, really thinking about what does pay to mean for our organisation. Um, so, can maybe someone talk to the, um, the integration experience? You know, what does it take to get your business live with pay to? Um, Jamie, I, I might stay with you. Um, mm -hmm. Can you please just you know, talk about the integration process? Yeah, so I'll talk about the, just to be clear, the technical integration process. So I know there's usually, you know, all that fun paperwork that needs to be done um, beforehand. But from a technical standpoint, again, I'm going to say it varies quite a bit. But at the very least, um, the scoping phase is critical. So this is where we actually take the time to really understand the business process and work together to map out how pay to will function within that existing business process, whether it's something they want to change um, and really just help plan everything out before the integration actually begins. Just so that once you do start, you can hit the ground running and you've thought of every edge case, happy paths, unhappy paths, all that fun stuff. And then once that um, scoping phase is complete, which again, could take one session, you know, like it could take a few weeks, depending on the complexity and the business scenario. Um, we then just hand over the keys to a sandbox environment. So that's where the actual merchants um, engineering team can jump right in and start integrating. And in terms of the timing that would take, just as a fun little stat here, what we've seen is for a very simple, like just a basic straightforward pay to integration, you're looking at anywhere between four hours to a full day to integrate with Zeto's API for pay two. So it can be very simple, but completely understanding that most of the work is really building out the actual application layer and really deciding where you want to take that user journey and whether you want to keep it really simple or if you want to um, use the you know, 80 plus different error codes that we have that we make available and create unique user journeys per error code that might come back. So that's where it really opens things up in terms of the integration piece as to how long it might take, but at its simplest, simplest state, you'd still be looking at about a day to under a day's worth of work. And then plus depending on the customization and the business process that you wanna go forward with. 
Okay, interesting. So you kind of talked about unhappy paths and some of the error codes. Can you maybe talk, mm. one of the questions from the audience um, is what are the most common unhappy paths um, that you're experiencing? Mm. Maybe you want to keep or, going? And, um, yeah, I can, I can. If not, I'll just mute myself. And I'll, <laughs> but yeah, I can give a few examples and Tom or Justin, feel free to jump in. But um, the most common unhappy path that we're seeing is whether their user's bank, uh, the bank account selected is pay to enabled. So as an example, I could accidentally put in my mortgage bank account. And of course, you know, that's going to be rejected. Um, and the second biggest one is insufficient funds. So depending on the user flow, if you're automatically, let's just say it is a recurring payment and my energy bill again is coming out at the end of the month and I completely forgot, it is, put, put, my God, it is possible that there will be insufficient funds. So that is still, I would say, the two most common unhappy paths that we're seeing at the moment. Okay, fantastic. Anything else to add, Justin or, or Tom, on that? Otherwise, I can move to the next question. No, I think, I think that sort of covers it. I think, you know, as... To date, you know, we've, we've just had the, the final of the big four banks come online. And so that initial um, error that we're seeing around pay to banks not being enabled, you know, theoretically, we hope to see that that drop. Um, but yeah, up, up to this point, it's probably the most common mm -hmm. on the agreement okay, side. Great. great. Look, I might just jump back to audience because there's one that's been voted up quite a bit. Um, and I think uh, Tom or Justin, they might be from one of you guys. So... I'll read it out. Do we know from the bank side where pay to debit sits on the sequencing of debit timing? So for example, $100 in a user's account, there is a $100 direct debit scheduled and a $100 pay to debit initiated. Who gets the funds? And would this be different bank by bank? So Justin. Yeah. So yeah, I, guess it's, I think I understand the question. So if a like a direct debit via Bex has been initiated, um, but technically hasn't cleared to this point, and a pay to transaction or payment is also initiated at that same point of time, I, I think it is going to vary by bank. Um, pay to as a concept will take those funds. You know, the clearance and settlement happens in real time. So if those funds are available from the bank, they will be debited in that real time. And so then subsequently, we would expect to see that, um, let's call it a pending transaction, ultimately fail. It, it's probably not going to show us pending. It's still sitting in the um, waiting to be cleared. So hard to give a definitive answer, but I'd say, yeah, it is going to vary by bank. Um, but in the, I guess, the case of pay to, if, if funds are there, the bank is going to clear and settle them. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so another question, uh, so I actually love this one, Igor Ivanov, I hope I've said that right. He's, um, he's been looking through our articles and he's posted a link. Um, according to our, our own articles, only BBAN can be passed as a debtor's account identifier. How can we pass pay ID instead? Tom, I reckon this one's for you. Yeah, 100%. No, thanks for the question, Igor. I think... Um... So at the moment, that's correct. Um, as at today, only a bank can be passed as a pay to account identifier. Um, but uh, our our team um, is working very hard at the moment um, in order to set up um, a you know a direct integration with the addressing service in order to facilitate um, the passing of um, various alias types through um, as account identifiers. So that'll be mobile, email, organisation identifier, and ABN. Um, and we would expect um, you know, that to be uh, live in the product um, by the end of the quarter. Um, so, yeah, watch the space. Um, you know, we expect to really release a, a spec at least in the next um, couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, we'll see how we go. But otherwise, yeah, thanks for that one. Fantastic. Um, so another one that's had a couple of votes. Um, so for the merchants who have implemented pay to, what is the customer adoption and perception of pay to looking like this far? Um, Justin, I might get your take on this. I mean, I'll preface any answer with that it's very early on in, in, in the process, right? So a, a lot of merchants that we've been working with, you know, have ultimately been waiting for a level of account reachability to reach a certain point, which as of August, so you know, a matter of three or four weeks ago, we've only just hit that that ninety one percent mark. And so, 
to give an answer with any sort of confidence in definitive numbers is, is quite hard. Um, I think we are seeing a, you know, particularly around um, how pay to works when it's compared to, to other payment methods, it is, you know, resonating pretty well from what we've seen both with merchants and on the customer side. Um, we expect that to, I guess, be further enhanced by you know, the previous question, the introduction of the pay ID as an option to create a pay to agreement. So, yeah, I don't know, Tom, if you've got anything else to add to that, but I say it is still very early on to say, you know, confidently um, what the level of uptake and, and customer reaction is truly going to be. Yeah, I, I think like that's that's bang on. Um, but I think in the market more generally, like the steer that we've got is that, you know, what you're sort of seeing at this stage is some 5,000 agreements created on a weekly basis. And that's sort of increasing at roughly three and a half percent week on week. Um, you know, in terms of agreement creation. Um, and, you know, that's sort of some positive growth you know, over the last five or so months. Um, that would land us with some sort of circa 30,000 agreements um, that exist in the world at large. Um, and some of the stats that, you know, that we've been given, um, you know, through the sort of AP Plus uh, network, you know, we get to sort of see that, uh, that, that, that sort of information. And largely at the moment, seeing sort of cancellation or agreement cancellation numbers in the order of around sort of, Two point two and a half thousand a week, um, with the with the um, I think the sort of proviso there being that those um, cancelled agreements are likely sort of ad hoc one off, um, in structure. So, yeah, we're sort of seeing more generally, you know, growth in the market with agreement creation, um, and um, you know we expect that to continue as we, uh, you know, as we move forward, um, and continue to refine the product by introducing, um, you know, new account identifier like Pay ID, um, and sort of seeing, you know, just those sort of that remaining nine percent at the top end of the market. Um, you know, becoming available and the banks refining their experiences as well um, to support adoption. Awesome. Some, some great numbers there. Thanks for sharing that, Tom and Justin. Uh, we've, we're coming down to under five minutes and a um, bunch of questions. So if, if we don't get to your question in this conversation, we will absolutely have them all captured and we'll be following up afterwards and someone in the team will reach out uh, with a response to any question that's been posted. So if you've got questions, please feel free to continue to post them. Um, we will follow up. Uh, but let me just ask a couple, uh, this one's been voted up as well. Uh, any NPP standards around migrating existing direct debit agreements to pay to agreements? Um, Tom, I think that one might be for you. Yeah, great. Yeah, so there are, um, is the short answer, yes. Um, at this stage, um, what does that mean? Uh, at this stage, there's been no migration of DDRs um, to, to pay to agreement across the network. Um, so I just preface my answer by, by saying that at this point. Um, in terms of, um, you know, sort of preference or how that can be done, um, yeah, there are a number of restrictions that, you know, that we have to navigate around how we handle that. Um, and ultimately at this point, um, what is likely a, a sort of a more or a, um, a more sort of customer friendly pathway um, is to create a pay to agreement on the same terms um, as this sort of pre existing DDR. Um, you know, ultimately, if you're setting up a new system, um, it's worth being mindful that um, quite often, if there is a permission to migrate, you know, a DDR to a pay to agreement. Um, approval is going to be or the express approval of the end customer is going to be requ required anyway um, and also um, yeah just very conscious as well of um, not creating situations where you can double debit so yeah long story short yes there are restrictions um, and um, and ultimately there's sort of that um, that move to sort of balance the movement of sort of one mind system to another um, and um, you would be keen to find out more about you know about your specific use case and what it is that you're, you know, you're thinking there in terms of migration um, but yeah, I might stop there with that one. I think it's still sort of a developing sort of a space. Okay, awesome. No, thanks for that. So we're into the final minute. I did just want to ask one last question of, of the panel. Um, so in less than 30 seconds, uh, what's one piece of advice you would want everyone to, to leave with today on this call when thinking about a pay to uh, implementation? Um, Jamie, do you want to kick us off? <laughs> yeah, I'll say start now. So it's early enough days that you actually have time to work with your customers and understand the user experience and make tweaks before the volumes really pick up. So that would be my biggest recommendation is really start now while the volume is still picking up so that you can really customize that flow. So by the time it's up there, then you've, you're already a pro in it. 
Awesome. Start now. I love it. Um, yep. Tom, anything from you? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I, I think at this stage, um, there's sort of a, a yeah, deeply understanding, um, you know, you're you, your in customers, you know, needs and, and your own use case, um, because ultimately, you know, pay to is, uh, is a new payment mechanic that will fit in and be directly compared to others, you know, um, in, in, your, uh, in your payment flow. And sort of one of the problems that I suppose that that's, you know, ideally solving is from a competitive perspective, you know, you're providing a full suite and giving your customers, you know, choice um, in a way that's also advantageous to your business. Um, so I think, again, just sort of like, you know, customer centricity 100% um, and, uh, you know, do engage us, you know, to, to talk that through because, um, you know, we'd love the opportunity to ask a few questions ourselves too. So thank you. Awesome. And Justin, we're right on time. Anything for you to, to add? Yeah, I guess just real quickly, you know, um, as Tom just said, we've been working very closely with, you know, a bunch of organizations who are thinking about pay to in the context of new use cases and, you know, Jamie can attest to this as well. It's really quite exciting seeing, you know, not just not or pay to not just being a replacement for your traditional direct debit, but you know, it evolving across e-com, across a whole bunch of different different areas. So I guess my piece of, of of advice would be, you know, think about how pay to can solve some of those challenging business problems that perhaps other payment methods don't necessarily fit into um, or handle efficiently. So, you know, we've certainly seen a number of those come up, particularly over the last six months um, and hoping to continue to see some of those use cases um, manifest themselves and, and work through them. Awesome. Love it. So start now and learn, be customer centric and make sure you're aligned to solve a business problem. Awesome. All right. Well, look, thank you so much to Jamie, Justin, and Tom. Really appreciate the amazing insights you've shared today. I know certainly I've taken away a lot. I hope the audience has as well. Uh, and again, thank you to all who joined and attended and for all your comments and questions. Like I said, we will follow up. Um, so much appreciate uh, everyone's engagement there. Uh, we're gonna be running another session in another month's time. So we'll send out invites to everyone on this call. Um, We've got uh, a couple of our senior executives at Cybos next month, which is a, a major um, uh, financial technology conference. Uh, so we're looking to give a bit of an update and share some insights of what was learned on the ground there. Uh, but so watch this space for more details uh, coming. I'll wrap it up there. Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, all the best. Thank you.